Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, co creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award winning blog, and service organization helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. I am so excited to bring today's guest to you, my my friend, my colleague, Phil Anderton. We have known each other for longer than I think either of us would like to admit at this point (laughs) in this space. And it's amazing given how far apart we live, because Phil comes to us from across the pond, that we have managed to see each other many times over the years. We met at an international conference on ADHD, and we regularly see each other there. So I am thrilled to to bring Phil to this conversation because he, I'm going to let him tell you what got him here, but here's how I want to frame it for you. Not only is he the most delightful, affable, playful, fun-loving human, one of the most I've known, but he has this ability to take ADHD very seriously and hold it lightly all at the same time. And has a a deep understanding of the profound impact of ADHD, all the cascading ways that it can influence society and people's lives. And he's really set out um, consistently and in different ways throughout his career to systematically change the way that we experience, understand, diagnose, and treat ADHD to improve the process of medical management for thousands and thousands of people. As you can tell, I'm a big fan, and I know you will be soon. Phil, welcome to the conversation. I'm so glad to have you here. Wow, thank you. That's one hell of an introduction, Elaine. I'm not sure I can even start to stand up to what you've just the pedestal you put me on, but thank you. You don't need a pedestal. You're so tall. (laughs) (laughs) There are times over the years I've climbed onto furniture, everybody, to give them a hug. Hello. So let's start with, tell us a little bit about what you do now with families of what I like to call complex kids, but specifically you work largely in the realm of ADHD. And then I want to go to, how did you come to get here? Because your journey has been fascinating. The here and now is that I'm the managing director of an organisation, ADHD 360, and we offer 360 degrees of help and support for the patient or the family with ADHD. The name is no accident. And in that, we we pre-screen, we assess, we diagnose, we medically treat, and we psychoeducate and provide further interventions for our patient group. Our youngest patient is the age of five. Our oldest patient is the age of 76. And we assess 1,200, 1,300 patients, new patients every month. I have a team of about 160, 165 people. One third, one half of those are medics uh, of some sort, and the others are in the admin and support roles. We're all over the UK. We start in America soon. We open our first clinic in Texas soon. And then we'll be moving out to the Middle East and then Australia. So that's what we do with the now, if that helps. Beautiful. So the, all of that is to say he's landed in a place where he's figuring out, figured out and figuring out how do you make comprehensive, excellent care available to people with ADHD. But you did not start as a healthcare provider. In fact, no. how did you get started on this journey? 20 odd years ago, as a middle ranking police officer, 
I was given the responsibility to reduce the amount of young people coming into the criminal system, into the criminal justice system. And one of my one of my crew, a tremendous guy called Steve Brown, who Elaine, you have met on a, on a number of occasions, um, he came back after two weeks of of research and said, "There's this thing called ADHD." And the interesting part for you, boss, is that it does affect people's behaviour. It affects their outcomes if it's not treated properly. And as importantly as anything else, it's genetically passed. So for us as police officers, if we were having families that generationally were troubled and struggling to fit into society and achieve their their best potential, who was looking at their mental health? Was anyone looking at their mental health? And should we get someone to look at their mental health to make that an alternative pathway to one of of crime in what, whatever format we, we might determine that to be? And that became 20, 22 years ago, I think it was, that became the rationale for how I got involved. And if you go back, Elaine, 20 odd years ago, we weren't talking about ADHD like we do now. We weren't accepting ADHD like we are now. It it, it was a bit left field and there there was a huge nervousness in us connecting the dots to having a mental health disorder, for want of a word, being neurodiverse wasn't even thought about as an expression and connecting the dots to um, social outcomes, including criminal behaviour that weren't palatable. These days, it's a lot more common to talk about what happens if you don't treat somebody properly. And that I think those conversations are there to put pressure on systems and processes to look after people more. But 20 years ago, we didn't have that pressure point. It was relatively unknown. And what you'll, I don't know how much you know about this, but 20 years ago in the United States, there was a gigantic funded smear campaign against ADHD as a condition. We have another podcast episode that talks about that, that I'll link to in the show notes with Kelly Pickens. But there is a, there was an all out concerted, let's file lawsuits against doctors and schools Mm -hmm. and providers and teachers. And it really created this environment of fear around ADHD. I I remember. would otherwise be a caretaker. I remember it happening and we looked on from the UK and we looked onto that thinking, holy moly, that's ridiculous. And that that it didn't happen as much here. We got negative media campaigns. And I remember the first time I did a television interview on the work we were doing, that there was all sorts of constabulary briefings as to what to say, what not to say, in case it went down the avenue of the nursayers. And I, I coined these expressions now and I've written about them and, and I use them a lot. There were in those days that you talk about, and to some degree still are, but a lot less, and they certainly have a lot less influence now. There were people that thought the earth was flat. There were people that thought Elvis was still alive. And there were people denied that we walked on the moon. And and those are the people that believed ADHD didn't exist and it had no place in the medical dictionary. I do talk very honestly and openly about the fact that I've met people who've been to space and they've shown me their photographs of earth and it is not flat. I have spoken to people who have worked with the man that went on the moon and I have sat and had dinner with a doctor who was present at Elvis's autopsy and still has part of his liver in a pickle jar on his desk. So yeah, I'm that's pretty convinced. Pretty unusual. Yeah, that's a claim, isn't it? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that ADHD does exist and the earth is not flat. Elvis has died and we did put man on the moon and we have to accept the presence of the fact that not everybody's wiring is exactly the same. And some people can just have a little bit of help with their wiring and we can actually sort an awful lot of things out for them for the better of themselves and those around them. And I get really passionate about whether we call it ADHD, ADD, whether we call it walking the dog syndrome doesn't matter. If there's a set of interventions we can make that can help someone make them happier, then why on earth would we debate it? We should just be doing it. Yeah. It's interesting. I did a brief video. I was talking to a group in in our community during an office hours. And sometimes I go on little, maybe little rants, or maybe I preach a little bit. And I was talking about the decision about whether or not to take medication as a person with ADHD. And because I struggled with it for a long time. And what I realized for me was it's not that I need it and I can't function at all without it. It's just that my life is a whole lot better when I manage my ADHD, which for me mm. includes some medication and other management modalities. But it's about quality of life that we're talking about. 
it's really interesting because you've got rating scales and you've got the DSM and you've got all of that stuff that we have to be aware of and work with. And of course we do, but we get all our patients to set three treatment goals. And the most common goal out of anybody is they want to be happy. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm now in a privileged position with 160, 170 employees that we can make 1,300 people happier every month than they were the month before. That's a huge privilege that we shouldn't take lightly. And we should accept that if I've got a purpose on the planet, then I think I've found my purpose. And if I can tell you a quick anecdote, 20 years ago, two management tiers above me after I'd left the police in a consulting role as a management consultant with the, was a chap I barely knew. And he reached out to me last Wednesday evening through LinkedIn. My daughter's had an assessment for ADHD. They can't um, put her on a medication pathway for another nine months because they're so busy. Can you help? And she was reassessed by us yesterday. She's on medication treatment now. And even just being listened to, heard, assessed and validated within five days, he's reported to me by text that she's had the best week of her life so far. And all we've done is listen to her and hear her journey. She's 16 and got a very low self-esteem, God love her. And validation of the diagnosis is a game changer. And I'm overusing the word, but what a privilege to be able to do that for somebody in a, such a positive set of outcomes. Um, this is damned hard work, this field of medicine, but it's actually probably the most rewarding. So what occurs to me as I'm hearing you speaking is that I can imagine when this was first introduced to you, when your colleague first came to you and said, there's this thing called ADHD that affects behaviors and outcomes and it's genetically passed. When you first heard it, did you think, yeah, this is it? Or did you think, oh, come on? Were you skeptical? Oh, of course. And and that 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 skepticism of a policeman's mindset, for crying out loud, there's no one more skeptical than an English cop. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. in those days, if somebody told me it was Wednesday, I wouldn't believe them till they read it on the top of a newspaper. Yeah, we had to dig in and but we felt it was worthwhile. And there was a lady in the UK called Barbara Worrell, and she'd helped Steve understand ADHD. And she's a force of nature is Barbara still is. And we went to her and we met with her. And then she introduced us to Andrea, Andrea Bilbo at Addis, who a lot of people know. And, and, and on our site, I'll put a link to that for people to. Ec excellent. And then we got, in, long story short, in fact, there's a really cute tale if we get the chance, but long story short, got invited to a launch event of Stratera in the Midlands of the UK. Stratera was being launched and we rocked up to this event. And there was a clinician from America who'd been part of the team that had done the clinical trials of Stratera, atomoxetine. And, and Robert took us to one side and spent an hour and a half with us. And he had two brains, both the size of planets. And from that moment on, we knew that ADHD was real and there was something in there. And we, we set off on our mission. The quirky bit of that tale, if I can, yeah, is that the rep for Eli Lilly, who was running that event, became a friend. She then relocated from the Midlands of the UK down to Cornwall, my brother was living in Cornwall. I asked him to pop around and make sure she was okay as she settled into her house. They're now married. So there oh, you go. that's lovely. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. And there's so many things I love about the story, but but this this journey from skepticism to, a, to understanding and acceptance is a common journey in the ADHD space, mm -hmm. right? Probably yeah. more so than almost any other and, medical condition heard of. I would agree. Yes. So when you speak to families, whether they're adults with or partners or parents or whatever, what's the access point you give to people who start off skeptical? But that's a really great question, because within families and parents these days, we, we get a lot less skepticism whilst they're looking for help. What The more skepticism we find, sadly, is in the professionals that deal with that young person's life for a child or something. And and where you've got a yeah. sceptical teacher or a sceptical GP in primary care. I think, you know, my, my, my most favoured technique is to just talk about why not? Why not see what help can be given to this person? Whether you believe in ADHD or not, if we can improve their life and improve their outcomes, why would we not try and do that? And if I can't come back to you with evidence of doing that, we can revisit the conversation. 
So if the, cause I've, I've played with this conversation and the responses, but you're talking about giving stimulants to children. Yeah. And we have parents come up with that one. And there were parents with me the other day, I was at a dyslexia event and there was a mum stood with me. She said, I'm not sure about medicating my child. I said, okay, what do you do if your child has a headache? I'll give them paracetamol. I said, have you looked at the side effect profile of paracetamol, Tylenol? <laughs> right. call it, what, what, what. it would never and be. And they look at me and they say, I promise you, it's more horrendous to read than anything for any of the medicines for ADHD. And then I had a parent, only, only this morning, I had a meeting with two parents and they were saying, we do want our little Billy assessed for his ADHD so we can get accommodations at school, but we're not at all sure about medication. And I said, OK, let's just play with that for a second. What's the one accommodation you would want at school for your child? Oh, more time in exams. I said, I promise you that your child will look at an exam paper as an untreated person with ADHD and they will not have a clue how to initiate answering those questions or what to do with it. And that hour of that exam will be the longest and worst hour that they could ever have. If you extend that time without treating them for their ADHD, you are extending their pain. That is all you are achieving. If we treat them so they can actually look at that paper and think, right, I'm ready to go and I'm ready to answer that. And here we go. This is my time. That is an achievement. And mum looked at me and she went, I'd never seen it that way before. And I said, accommodations don't answer the question. The question is, how can we get your Billy to be happier and lead his best life? And that's what we do. Hi, it's Elaine. And if you like this podcast, you'll love our coach approach. Whether you're a parent looking for support or a professional supporting families, we invite you to download a free guide with 12 key coaching tools at impactparents.com slash gift. You can begin using a coach approach to help kids become more independent or improve all of your conversations at work and at home. That's impactparents.com slash gift. Okay. The answer to skepticism is, I think what I'm hearing is that there is the evidence at this point is incontroversial. It's overwhelming. And of course, from 20 years ago, when I was first putting my toe in the water to now, where I am now, fortunately, is 1,300 patients a month whose lives we've changed. That evidence base, I can just cite that, I can quote that, click my fingers and yeah. bang. And that's a wonderful place for me to be in as an advocate for change, because it is very difficult to challenge that now, because I'm no longer relying on Barclays' evidence, Tom Brown's evidence, all the, all the great people I work with's evidence. Right. I'm relying on empirical evidence that comes straight from the coalface. And that is a very strong place to be as a negotiator. Yeah. <laughs> and that's ultimately what it is, right? You always bring this police officer's mindset to this work on some level, right? And got to have your evidence base. And if you've got your evidence, you can present your case. And if you can present your case, you stand more chance of winning it. I, we are pretty organized with that these days um, because we still are fighting battles, funding battles with the National Health Service. Schools not wanting to actually see that ADHD will exist in a child who doesn't misbehave as if misbehaving is the only thing that can occur with someone with ADHD. And we've still got we've still got some work to do, for sure. So you got through documenting evidence. You were working with Justice Center, justice reform by getting into education. And when I first met you, you were still a police officer, educating police mm -hmm. officers about ADHD. What's the shift for you that got you to, to where you are now, where you became a healthcare provider? That's a big shift. Yeah, it's, it's not the usual journey for a British cop. <laughs> I think there were three seminal points, really. The first one was, it was okay educating other cops, but actually what we needed to do was in, influence healthcare professionals to actually accept quicker referrals from the criminal justice system so that the person with potential ADHD a suspected ADHD, could actually be assessed and, if necessary, diagnosed so that we actually could discuss why the offences that were being charged had occurred and we could see if we could change that, that, that behavioural pathway rather than using prison or a fine as a punitive way of, of changing things. Could we not change things by having better health care? So that was the first step. So can I stop you there for a second? Because I, I'm hearing the but buts, right? And there are going to be some people who are saying people have to take responsibility for their actions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This isn't an excuse. 
it, but it's an explanation as to why things might happen. An example could be taking cocaine to alter the um, dopamine levels of our own brain to normalise behaviour, which is clearly against the law. But actually, if there's no medical uh, intervention available and somebody takes cocaine and finds it works, they're going to continue to do that. Driving at speed in a motor car over the speed limit. The thrill-seeking, not concentrating ADHD driver will do that more than anybody who's not who's neurotypical. It doesn't excuse it, but it does explain why it might happen. The very common one, which I roll out an awful lot, is we have ex-prisoners who come out of prison and they're on probation and they have to comply with their probation license before to stay out of prison. And most of them are breached and most of them go back and most right. of them are breached because they fail to turn up for an appointment. They're not breached for committing crime. They're breached for not managing time appropriately. And guess what goes hand in hand with ADHD that's not treated appropriately? It's managing time. And as a simple example, if we can't, if we can treat somebody to the point where they can manage time, we can stop them breaching their probation license and going back into prison. There's so many different examples. If we replace the cocaine with methylphenidate and they don't need the cocaine, we can keep someone off cocaine. So, yeah, there are the but buts, and there always will be. And I, I was a cop for 27 years. I, I, I don't believe in washing away the fact that someone needs to own up to their responsibilities, but I also believe that the professionals responsible with giving everybody the chance of having their best life step up to their responsibilities as well. Yeah, and that if we can start working together, we can actually create an environment. What strikes me is that we talk all the time about accommodations in the school environment. And we don't talk enough about the accommodations in the justice system, the accommodations in the home environment, that the ways that we need to set people up for success instead of constantly setting them up for failure. Absolutely. And then pointing fingers and saying, see, 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 we told you. Yeah. And the criminal justice system, when I managed to get it to understand ADHD, whether that was in the UK or in the USA, we did we had some pretty good results. I remember, I don't know if you remember Chad up at Cleveland in Ohio, and we'd gone before Chad started as a conference, and we did some work with the Justice Department and, and with the courts, and, and we got them setting up specific courts for mental health affected patients and uh, offenders and witnesses, where they would understand the ADHD for either the witness or the offender and run the court process differently. So even just in that small accommodation, there was more of a chance of a fair hearing and of the person being given the best opportunity to account for themselves. Little things like if you have a 10 o'clock appointment for somebody with ADHD and you leave them sat outside till two o'clock in the afternoon, you can bet your bottom dollar by the time they get in, they've burst their bubble. They've completely and utterly lost it. If somebody is on medication, and that's medication's not going to be efficacious at the time of the um, at the time of the court hearing. We should either give them the opportunity to medicate, or we should adjourn until such times as it's going to be efficacious. Those things are not beyond the wit of man to put into place, but they're not common practice. And I, I'm, I'm proud of that. Some of the legacy across the globe is some of those things now take place on a regular basis, and and so they should. Similarly, with exams and accommodations, are not that difficult. And, and I know from the work we've done talking about non-medical interventions, Elaine, and the converse, the great conversations we continue to have, an awful lot of interventions in, in particular in the workplace or in the classroom that you would make for somebody who's neurodiverse are just as effective for someone who's neurotypical. And, and when I boil it down for teachers, I say that, that, that there's this great thing that I say that people with ADHD do not have learning difficulties. I resent somebody with ADHD being quoted as having learning difficulties because what they actually have is a difficulty learning and that is completely different. And to make it easier to learn is a gift of the teacher. It's not a gift of the pupil. And the responsibility doesn't sit with the child to learn better. It's with the teacher to teach better. And if they taught better for everybody, they'd also include the neurodiverse student. And I know, and I'm just I'm hearing the but, but, but. So that's not to say that there aren't a lot of kids with ADHD who also have learning disabilities or difficulties, but that's not what you're speaking to. What you're speaking to is that ADHD yeah. itself isn't a learned dis disability. It's a difficulty in learning. Absolutely. And some of the brightest people on the planet have ADHD. For sure. 
So before we we wrap and we we need to start wrapping, I interrupted you a little while ago and you were going to say three things and you got through one of them. Oh, bless you. Uh, yeah. the <laughs> second, the, yes, I do. The second one was when I tried to convince the National Health Service to actually pay more attention to those potential offenders to keep them out of the criminal justice system and put them in the health system. And our National Health Service, bless their cotton socks, said we don't have the funds to actually police the justice system. We've enough trouble getting people in our own system into treatment, so we're not going to take on any more. And that eventually went to ministerial level in the government, and there was still a disagreement as to why the health service would try and help the justice system. They just missed the point. So that became a bit of a, a point for me where I recognised this was going to be a difficult battle. And then the third one was I was sponsored to work as a management consultant for two years in ADHD clinics to improve their efficiency and effectiveness. And most clinical settings are based on such old fashioned values and old fashioned processes that to get them to be efficient and effective was really hard work. And it was at that point I decided, no, we're just going to go and do this. We're going to open a clinic that actually does work with the criminal justice system to expedite people being seen. We're going to do it properly. We're going to do it efficiently and effectively. We're going to do it to scale and we're going to do it to a world class standard. And hopefully that's how people see our clinic, because that's what we try and do. Beautiful. So great segue. Tell people about your clinic and, and what you do, how people can find out more about you. Um, like anybody, we have a website and there's an awful lot of information on the website about how we do what we do. The beauty of what we do is our processes are digitized. So all my clinicians do it exactly the same way at exactly the same point of the patient journey. And everybody knows what to expect and when. Our interface with the patients is through video conference, which is self to has proven to be incredibly effective for the ADHD community, being in the comfort of your own home, being able to be assessed by a, a very qualified and empathetic clinician whilst you're sat in your kitchen or on your bed is a far happier place for someone than being in a clinic with white coat syndrome, the anxiety of getting there on time and all of those other matters, which just skew the validity of the results of the assessment. So that's the way we do things. And then we, we do favour medical treatment because that's what the science says works. But we also back that right up with an awful lot of psychoeducation. And we, we run an incredible amount of webinars and other interventions and offer training packages, one, two, three magic. And all of this stuff is on offer to our patient group so that we do blend the, the clinical with the non-medical so that we offer the patient the best outcomes that they can get. Right. Beautiful. So we're going to wrap this conversation. What would you like to add? Either what do you want to go back and highlight that we've talked about? Or is there seven, something we haven't spoken about that you want to make sure that you share before we wrap? I think I'd probably just highlight something that we briefly touched on. And, and that is, no matter how hard it is for the parent or the patient, ADHD is relatively straightforward to intervene with and to make a positive impact on for anybody. And anybody who suspects they have ADHD should really go and find out if they do or they don't, because it's a painless process, it's seamless, and we can really make a big impact very quickly on people's lives. And I sometimes think with all of the arguments and complexities, that point is overlooked. So I know it's the case in the States, and I suspect it is in the UK and, and in other places. It's a complicated diagnosis, or it can be because it's often a process of elimination diagnosis or it has been historically, or there's arguments about whether the gold standard is days of psychoeducational testing or so. So what allows you to make it so straightforward? Two things. First of all, we don't need to make it overly complex. For some bizarre reason, ADHD sits in psychiatry as its traditional home. It's no place in psychiatry. If somebody has co-occurring conditions that require them to be in psychiatry, so be it. It, neither does it sit in psychology because you've got to actually be able to medically treat and to be medically treating somebody with stimulant medication, you've got to understand medicine a little bit more. So it doesn't have a natural bed place. It doesn't have a natural falling place and therefore it's become over complex as different people have, have built their own thiefdoms around it. There's no need for that. It's relatively straightforward. And of course, those, those clinicians who've built their thiefdoms are the turkeys that won't vote for Christmas. We don't need to make this more complex than it needs to be. Most of the data we get for a clinic is achieved before the patient meets their clinician. 
And then when the clinician has reviewed all that information, they then meet the patient for the first time. And the diagnostic process is quite straightforward. We don't need three days, four days. We need a couple of hours of quality time, focused and pertinent, sitting on top of a whole raft of data that we've collected by other means. Well, and you do use quantitative data as part of your process, if I recall. A hundred percent. And we're probably, as a single clinic, we're probably the global, the biggest global user of the QB test as a screening tool. We use it throughout the process, not just at the start. We use it to validate that we've had the right effect. We use screening tools for or ASRS, as well as using the DSM and a semi-structured interview for the qualitative base. You've got to bend quality and you've got to blend the qualitative and the quantitative processes to be able to come out with your diagnosis. No one's trying to cheat the system here. What we're trying to do is make it usable. And there is no point in quackery. What we need is accurate medicine here. And turkey's Christmas quackery, you can see all the bird analogies coming out here, but this isn't the most complex aspect of mental health and nor should we allow it to become that just to protect ourselves and our industry. Beautiful. I think that is a, a fabulous point to, to close on, that uh, we have a responsibility to the people we serve to, to make it as simple as it possibly can be and still be accurate and comprehensive. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, and it's really important. So, Phil, thank you. Thank you for all you've done in the community. Thank you for being a, a trusted colleague for a long time <laughs> and more to come. And, and I really want to acknowledge and honor the role that you've played in, in recognizing the need. I always talk about see a need, fill a need. And as you saw the need more and more clearly, you have morphed in your career to find the way to fill the need most effectively. And I really acknowledge and honor that. It's a beautiful thing to witness. You know, that's very kind of you to say that, but I wouldn't have the strength of character and the belief in, in what the work we do if I hadn't worked for 20 years with people like yourself, who've always encouraged me, always given me that knowledge and that understanding. And even down to having dinner with you and David and just reaffirming beliefs and value statements over dinner. A very important part of this is the community that supports each other on the journey that we're on. Sure. So thank you again. Thanks for being here. To those of you listening, thank you for what you're doing for yourself, for your kids, for your families, for your communities. Thanks for taking the time to think about it, process it, pay attention. And I want to ask you to take a moment to think about what you've heard in this conversation between Phil and me and pause for a moment and ask yourself, what are your insights from today? What are you taking away? It's not about what we were talking about. It's about what does it mean for you? And perhaps what do you want to do with that information? Is there some action you want to take, some conversation you want to have, someone you want to share it with? What's important to you about what you've taken from today? And on that note, thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.